Now we know that neuronal representations of the external world are formed in the brain by the activity of, th of many thousands of neurons, each responding to diverse, and uh, diverse environmental features. Now what determines this feature selectivity is um, the ability of these neurons to respond to a specific pattern of synaptic input by firing coherent patterns of action potentials. And the work that I'm going to talk to you about today has been testing the idea that experiences that we make during learning change via mechanisms of synaptic plasticity, this input-output transformation in hippocampal neurons, which then enables the formation of new representations that the brain then uses to drive learning. Okay, so to um, investigate how experiences can change brain activity, I've been focusing, I've been studying hippocampal area CA1. And this area is particularly well suited for this line of inquiry because neurons in CA1 form as play cells, spatial representations of the animal's environment, which are both experimentally tractable and known to be involved in tasks that require spatial learning. For example, the, the very famous um, Morris, Morris water maze task. So play cells were, of course, discovered by John O'Keefe and colleagues about 50 years ago. And these are neurons that fire action potential specifically when the animal is in a particular location of its environment. So in this case, um, I should say that here each red dot corresponds to an action potential and the white line corresponds to the, to the trajectory of the animal in an open field box. So you see that this neuron fired action potential specifically when the animal was in the right upper corner of the environment. Now, in any given environment, about 25 to 50 percent of C1 cells will be place cells. Their firing fields, or place fields as they are called, um, are distributed throughout the entire environment, suggesting that as a population, these cells um, form a spatial map and inform spatial navigation of the animal. Interestingly, though, when one looks at the activity of a population of C1 cells, C1 place cells, um, it becomes evident that there's more to the story. So in this plot here, this is a population of about 1,100 place cells from my own experiments. Each row corresponds to the mean activity of a single place cell. The x-axis corresponds to the position of an animal on a linear track. And the black color essentially marks for each of these place cells its firing field peak. And you see that, yes, these place cells tile the entire environment, but there's this location here at 90 centimeters with an abnormally increased number of place fields. And so this is, of course, the location where the, where, um, the animals that are thirsty because they are water restricted receive a water reward. So what, this, what the presence of this reward over reward over representation shows is that um, C1 population activity um, reflects, in fact, the experience of the animal. It, it reflects what's significant to the animal. And so I'm interested in understanding the mechanisms that allow for this to happen. Okay, so just to orient you briefly about the anatomy. So the CA1 is part of the mouse hippocampus, which is a three-layered structure located in mice between cortex up here and thalamus down here. It has three major subregions, the dentate gyrus, the CA3 area, and the CA1 area. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, we're going to focus for today's talk on the C1 area up here. Um, from an excitatory input perspective, each C1 pyramidal cell has two major dendritic input compartments, the perisomatic compartment, which comp consists of the epiglioblique dendrites and the basal dendrites, and which receives mostly intrahippocampal input coming from the CA3 area. The other compartment is the dendritic tuft up here, which receives long-range excitatory synaptic input coming mostly from layer three of the entorhinal cortex. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the excitation, there is, of course, inhibition. Inhibition is very complicated in C1, but I think it's OK to, broad, to say, broadly speaking, C1 interneurons fall into four broad categories, interneurons that target the axon initial segment, um, interneurons that target the soma, that target the dendrites, and finally, interneurons to target other interneurons and therefore um, are thought to net disinhibit the activity of the, of the principal pyramidal cells. So we know from um, previous work that inputs coming from CA3 are themselves spatially tuned. So cells in CA3 are also place cells. While it is less clear what the layer 3 and rhinal cortex inputs do, about a, frac a fraction of them, about 10 to 20 percent, have some kind of spatial tuning too, but they are usually described as kind of sloppily spatially tuned. And so now combining 
all, all these inputs that I've, I've told you now in light of these diverse synaptic inputs. The question that I'm going to address in my talk today is really, so what are the circuit mechanisms underlying C1 play cell activity? Or in other words, what is the relationship between these synaptic inputs and the play cell output of C1 pyramidal cells? So to address this question in awake behaving mice, I'm training mice to run on a linear treadmill such as this one. You see here the mouse is head fixed. It runs on a track which has a length of 180 centimeters. It's divided up into three individual sectors. Each of the sectors is enriched with a different set of somatosensory and visual cues. And you can kind of see it in the video as they pass by. And so this gives the animal the impression to be in a kind of environment while being still in a very controlled environment. So we can easily um, you know, change features um, and so on. And so in this case then, as I mentioned, the animals are water restricted. So um, in this case, I'm giving one, I'm giving a reward once per lab, always at the same location. And what I refer to as lab is a complete revolution of the belt or a running distance of 180 centimeters. And you can kind of um, tell that the animal has learned the task well because of two reasons. One, the licking is really only restricted to the location where the reward is given. And the other one is that the animal slows down as it approaches the location where the reward is given and then accelerates again and then slows down again as it approaches the reward for the next time. So um, these are sort of the behavioral um, um, parameters I will talk about throughout the rest of the talk, licking and running speed. Okay, so um, one of the recording techniques that I use are somatic whole cell recordings. So these are, um, I choose to do whole cell recordings because it allows me to study the action potential output of the neuron of the play cell, but it also gives me access to the subthreshold membrane potential changes, which is of course um, driven by synaptic activity, which is a reflection of the input side of the neuron. So whole cell recordings are really currently the, the gold standard for studying input output transformations in individual neurons. And so to give you an impression what I mean by subthreshold activity, so this is one lab from one of my whole cell play cell recordings. You see the action potentials here in the middle. Here, this is the place field. And so from such a raw memory potential recording, we could then extract several subthreshold features. But for the purpose of today's talk, I'm only going to talk to you about one, which is this so-called slow memory potential depolarization in red, or also called ramp. And the ramp essentially describes the fact that as a mouse enters the place field, the memory potential will slowly depolarize, bring the, the, the memory potential to thresholds so that action potentials can be fired. And then as the mouse exits the place field again, the, the memory potential hyperpolarizes again, brings it back to baseline. Okay, and so using this technique then, we found a few years back that a certain type of burst firing is really efficient, is really powerful at driving the novel place field formation. So you can see this in this example cell here. Initially in lab five or six, it only fired a few spurious action potentials or was completely silent. But then after firing such a plateau, and I call it a little bit lab jargony plateau because this is the somatic signature of a large dendritic spike, a calcium spike, originated out in the dendrites of these neurons. So after firing such a plateau, you see immediately after a, a, a place field appeared and was there for the remainder of the recording. Now, because we are in whole cell recording, we, uh, in whole cell configuration, we can then play tricks. For example, we can do current injections to artificially, to quote unquote, artificially evoke plateaus. This is done here. And you see that also in this case, so this is now not the cell doing it. This is me doing a current injection. And you see that also in this case, a place field appeared and was there for the remainder of the recording. Now we did current injections um, everywhere along the track in all different locations. And we found first that it was equally possible to induce place fields anywhere on the track. And second, there was no observable difference in the place field strength measured by the, by the amplitude of this ramp depolarization that I showed you before. Also, I should say that, in, that evoking action potentials instead of these large plateaus was not, efficient, was not sufficient to drive place field formation. So it's really a, plat a plateau specific effect. Plateaus are both necessary and sufficient to drive place field formation. And I can also tell you that based on analyses and additional experiments that I don't have time to show you is we concluded or we concluded from analysis and experiments that I don't have time to show you that 
this place field formation was associated with an increase in the synaptic weight and not in the synaptic uh, input frequency. And so to what we concluded then from this work is the following, that each C1 pyramidal cell receives a, 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 heter a heterogeneous barrage of synaptic input coming from CA3. You see this here, so each Gaussian here represents a single synaptic input. You see they are spatially tuned and taken together, they cover the entire track. Then after the, 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 the neuron fires a plateau, there's a subset of excitatory synaptic input that have become potentiated. Um, um, the result of this potentiation is this ramp depolarization. And as I explained before, then the place field firing. So I, we also looked at the inhibitory inputs. Um, to cut, unfortunately, I don't have much more time to talk about it, but just to cut a long story short, we found the, the, the inhibition to be spatially, tu spatially untuned. So that it was very broad, essentially untuned. And so the function of the inhibition in this framework is then to um, sort of essentially uh, balance out unpotentiated inputs in silent cells or balance out unpotentiated out of field inputs in a place cell to prevent those from firing action potentials. The function of the plateau, of course, is here to essentially, um, you know, select these the, the synaptic inputs that are to be potentiated. And so it essentially um, determines the feature selectivity. And so the next question that I'm going to discuss with you then is, are our efforts to understand the mechanism underlying this plateau put plateau-driven potentiation. Are there any questions so far or has it been clear? Okay, I then, I move, then I move on. So to start thinking about this question, what is the mechanism underlying this plateau-driven potentiation? I wanna go back to the data. So this is one lab here, down here, where a plateau happened. And then in the next lab, uh, a place field would appear. And so this yellow tick mark up here corresponds to this yellow tick mark down here in position and essentially marks the beginning of the place field, or you could say the, um, the star, the beginning of or the location where, where um, synaptic inputs start to get potentiated. And so I wanna point out three features of this process. So once it's very fast, right? Only one trial is enough to drive um, this potentiation. Second, there's potentiation of inputs that are seconds that are active seconds before the plasticity driving event, in this case, the plateau. And down here, I marked for you the times in seconds. So you see these inputs here were active two and a half seconds before the plateau. And the third feature is that there is really potentiation of inputs that were, so, that were active so far ahead of the plateau that they had nothing to do with driving the plateau itself. And so I'm telling you these features because this contrasts, of course, very much with a established, um, with sort of the standard model of how we think plasticity works in the brain, which is spike timing dependent plasticity, which is often, which in the experiments requires often hundreds of trials, hundreds of pairings. It works only on a time scale of tens of milliseconds. So you need a tight temporal relationship between the pre and the post synaptic activity. And third, there's a, causal, there's a the directionality to the input. So only those inputs that were active before the postsynaptic cell was active um, are to be potentiated. And so we were very excited about this finding. And so we wanted to explore this further, especially because it was so different from the standard model, how plasticity works in the brain. So the first question was, is, okay, it, it seemed to have a long time course, but what is the exact time course of this plasticity? And so to address this question, um, Aaron Milstein, a former colleague in the lab, who's now a professor at Rutgers, and Sandro Romani, who's a, who's a computational neuroscientist and group leader at Janilia Research Campus, um, took our data about the extent and the amplitude um, of the ramp depolarization, and then made a model. And so the plasticity kernel then that best fitted our in vivo data is here shown in white. And so this is contrasted here with the plasticity kernel for the standard spike time independent plasticity rule in red, which has a time course of about 50 milliseconds, a uh, width of about 50 milliseconds. And so you see that our plasticity kernel is about two orders of magnitudes longer. It extends all the way from three seconds ahead of the plateau up to one seconds after the plateau. So to summarize here this slide, 
the, the plateau driven plasticity seems to follow an asymmetric seconds long rule. And so based on these, on this finding, then Sandro came up with a prediction, namely that if this is true, if really place fields are formed according to this new plateau driven plasticity rule, then there should be a lot linear relationship between the width of the place field and the running speed of the animal in the induction lab. And to illustrate what we mean by that is, let me show you two extreme conditions. So first, if the animal is running very slowly when the plateau happens, then it only a few synaptic input, um, um, only a few synaptic inputs are active within that four second plasticity time window that I mentioned before. So the, the consequence is only a few inputs will be potentiated and the ramp will be very narrow. In contrast, when the animal is running very fast, when, um, um, when the plateau happens, then uh, a much larger um, amount of synaptic inputs fit to, fit to that same four second plasticity window. They will, more inputs will be potentiated and the ramp will be wider. Okay, so we looked at our data. So I'm showing you here on the X axis, uh, on the Y axis, the width of the ramp, the place field width essentially. And on the Y axis is the running speed um, during the lab when the plateau happened, during the induction lab. And you see that indeed, there is this nice linear relationship with a plot with a slope of 2 about 2.5 seconds, very much consistent with our four second plasticity rule. And this, the red dotted line shows you the slope that we would expect if, BT if SCDP would apply, because essentially there would be no slope there, right? So in a 50 millisecond window, there are very few inputs are potentiated. So there's really no, none of these relationships. So our experimental data really supports this idea that, um, that place fields are formed according to that pl plateau driven plasticity rule. And just to summarize then, so we think we've, we, we, term, we, we think this new plateau driven plasticity rule is really a new form of synaptic plasticity that we discovered. We call it behavioral timescale synaptic plasticity or BTSP. And it has the following features. So it is driven exclusively by these plateaus that I mentioned are actually um, the somatic signature of dendritic spikes, calcium spikes in the dendrites. It's a, one it's a true one trial learning rule. So a single plateau is enough. I didn't have time to show you the data, but we have evidence, and I'm happy to talk about it if there are questions about it, but we, 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 can, we have data that it affects the, the proximal synapses, the CA3 to CA1 synapses. And it follows this asymmetric seconds long time course. Uh, Christine? Yeah. Christine, there's a question on the, uh, on, uh, sure. on the chat. Uh, would oh, you like to, to hear yeah. it? It's actually okay, a, it's a question time. by William Brown, uh, who's asking if, uh, is the ramp a filtered membrane voltage or are there no spikes at all? Question mark. I oh, sorry. Former. I should, yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned this. Yes, so the ramp is essentially taking the raw membrane potential recording um, cutting off the spikes and then low pass filtering it below one hertz. Yes, okay, sorry, I should have been more clear about that. No, it's, it's essentially every time you have a place, place field firing, you find this ramp that underlies it. So this is, uh, yeah, thanks okay. for this question. Fine, thank you. Okay, um, so you might have noticed, and it's good that we talk now about the ramp because you might have noticed that the, um, that in the example I showed you, the ramp is kind of asymmetric actually. And this is of course, due to the asymmetry in the plasticity time course. And this is, has in turn a, um, an interesting functional consequence for uh, the CA1 output, namely that place field firing that, um, that comes out of the CA1 area always precedes the, the plateau that generated it. So in, in this case here, um, you see here is the place field firing. He, this is the plateau. And you see that, yeah, in this case about, uh, in average, this is, this is about 10 centimeters. The peak firing precedes the plateau. So we, we, we conclude from this that BTSP in fact produces place fields that are predictive of the event that generated it. And I find this very interesting to think about what could be the behavioral consequence of this, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so I just added this now um, to the list of features. And so in the final part, I wanna talk briefly about some unpublished work. Um, so based on this 
based on this, um, based on these features, then see, um, BTSB is really a mechanism that could allow um, neurons to store an association between an event and a delayed outcome, let's say a reward, right? And that, that, that outcome can be delayed by up to a few seconds. And so because of this unique ability, then my idea was, okay, could be actually BTSB then the mechanism that allows for this um, a reward of a representation to form that allow for this experience dependent shaping of the C1 population activity to form. And so then the last question that I'm going to talk to you about today is then uh, does BTSB actually, is BTSB actually the mechanism that allow experiences to shape C1 representations? And the plateau could be kind of seen as a kind of teaching signal um, saying, okay, something significant has happened, now form a place field here. And so to answer that question, I turn to a different technique, which is two photon calcium imaging of CA1 representations. This is the timeline of my experiments. So the idea is that after a surgery that allows us access to the hippocampus, a short training period then, I image the same population of neurons for about a month. But for the purpose of today's talk, I'm only going to talk to you about the first two days, which I call day zero and day one. And so what's the difference there? So day zero was done in contrast to what I showed you previously on a belt that is devoid of any cues and you have variable reward location. So this is essentially only a, 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 an adaption phase for the animal. And then day one is on a, cue and a belt that is enriched with cues with one fixed reward location. It's very much like I showed you before. And you see that this is now the licking behavior. So each of these ticks marks a lick. And you see that here on day zero with the variable reward locations, there is not, there is no really pattern. There's no pattern. The animal essentially licks everywhere. But here then, after initially licking everywhere, the animal realizes, okay, I have to restrict my licking more and more to this specific reward location. And um, we can quantify this. It essentially happens in all the animals. So this suggests to us that yes, we can essentially uh, make a connection between our behavior and learning. And now we, of course, want to look at the activity of the neurons during this, this learning behavior. So this, just very briefly, so this is how an experiment looks like. Uh, you see here a typical field of view with CA1 pyramidal cells. On the right side, you have a, a activity. Um, so this is using a calcium indicator called a GCAMP6F. And you see here on the right, nine place cells, the activity. On the bottom, you have the running, the position trace, so as the animal runs, the position can be read out. And so based on these movies, then we can extract the activity for each of these place cells. Mm -hmm. So this is then the color plot that I generate based on that data. You see for this, I've shown you essentially before, this is now just data from a single animal. You see this accumulation of place fields as 90 centimeters, which is the reward location. And in contrast on day zero, there are few, much fewer cells and their place fields are much sloppier. I can quantify that. So this is data from this one single animal, and this is data across all the, all the animals I did this experiment in. And you see that already on day one, you have this reward over representation. So within an hour of experience, within an hour of doing this task, you have this reward over representation forming. And because all of this seemed to happening on day one, I can then ask a question about the time course. So um, yeah, you, we had, these are two example cells. Um, so you see that essentially cells are initially silent and then what, uh, just sort of out of the blue, you have these place cells popping up very much remis reminiscent of what I showed you before with the whole cell recordings. And so this is the time course of the appearance of these cells. You see that there is an initial phase, maybe 30% of the cells appear really early on. And then um, the majority of the cells sort of appears gradually over the session. But of course the question is, is BTSP involved? And um, so I, I, I have different lines of evidence that say, yes, it is. I'm trying to show you only once, which is I can pharmacologically block plasticity and I can pharmacologically block dendritic calcium spikes. And in both cases, essentially this reward over representation does not form. Okay, so this is shown here in the red traces. So just to summarize them, what I've told you so far. So C1 has two major inputs. Potentiation of these CA3 to CA1 inputs via BTSP, counteracted by uni spatially uniform inhibition, leads to predictive CA1 output and an output that is experience dependent. Now, very last point. 
So of course the plateaus have this um, really important role. And the question is now what drives these plateaus in vivo? And so we have previous experimental evidence that plateaus are actually driven by entorhinal cortex activity. And so I wanted to essentially um, um, ask the question, can, can we look at entorhinal cortex activity? We can image those axons that come into CA1 and see whether they could be responsible for driving these plateaus. And long story short, this is essentially what we found. So this is the activity of about 150 axons that I imaged with using a calcium indicator. And you see there is this peak um, here around the reward side. This is the average activity. Okay, so then to really summarize now. So this is the picture that emerges for us. So we have a neuron here that yeah, produces an experience dependent and predictive output. We have two pathways. We call the EC3 input a pathway, the instructive pathway input, because this is the pathway that drives the plateaus. Um, and then you have the CA3 input, which is essentially the learning pathway, because that's where ETSB works, so, works on. And so this is the instructive signal then. And so I didn't have time to talk about this part, this part at all, but we think that essentially what determines which synapses undergo um, plasticity is determined by a so-called eligibility trace, which was mentioned yesterday in a few talks, which is a filtered signal of the synaptic input. And so the um, combination of this instructive signal, which is the plateau, and this eligibility trace in certain synapses then lead to these weight changes. And yeah, this is just to remind me to mention that um, there's other work from other labs showing that this inhibition has a permissive role as well as neuromodulation. So that's really, it's, an, it's really a, a sort of all the circuit elements form to work together to kind of drive BTSB. These are the people that um, contributed to the work. I wanna thank especially my, my postdoc advisor, Jeff McGee, who's been just fantastic. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, as uh, Olivier mentioned, I'm gonna open my lab essentially in two days. So if you are interested in joining, or um, in collaborating, um, come visit us at beautiful Brandeis campus near Boston. So this is Boston downtown. You have the Charles, the Charles River coming by. Um, it's really worth a visit. And get in touch via my email, or this is the webpage. Thank you. And sorry for going over time a little bit. Uh, are you over time? I don't think so. No, do you have two more minutes. Uh, let's see. You have one one more question from oh, several questions. Right. Uh, all right. So a question by uh, William Brown again. So uh, about the first part of the talk, are the plateaus always caused by dendritic calcium spikes from the apical tuft? Or can they also be caused by sodium, spi sodium spikes that might be caused by CA3 input? Question mark. Yes, so let me just, so no, so plateaus are always caused by these calcium, are always caused by calcium spikes. So there is slice work from Jeff's lab and other labs. And so essentially what marks this calcium spike is this large depolarization that underlies the small sodium spike. So this is really the signature of those. So they are, yeah, so they are always associated with calcium spikes. Okay, um, a question by Romain Veltz. Do you think this plasticity rule is implemented as regular quote end of quote LTP AMPA uh, insertion or uses another mechanism? Yeah, so this is uh, totally speculation now. We are working on that, but yeah, that would be the idea that there, there is AMPA, there is rapid AMPA insertion going on um, within a few seconds after the plateau. So there might be some some pool of receptors, right, that are readily inserted. Okay, uh, in a few seconds, uh, oh, uh, more. Okay, I, I have to skip. Do you think that this type of plasticity generalizes to other types of tasks by mm. Ainger? Yeah, very good question. Um, I think, um, so, I mean, the big, it's not only to tasks, but to other areas. So um, I think it would be useful for many different tasks in many areas to have this sort of long time scale plasticity rule, um, but we don't know yet, right? So we welcome everyone to you know, try these protocols and see whether in their favorite task or in their favorite 
um, brain area of interest, you see a similar task. I should say that these plateaus are not specific to CA1. Any pyramidal-based microcircuit has these dendritic calcium spikes. So in principle, also layer five, uh, layer two, three. So all these circuits have plateaus. Whether they cause plasticity, you know, is, a, is another question. Thank, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, we are over, over time. Uh, there and are also, more questions.